The Awakening by Kate Chopin Part V Chapters twenty one to twenty five twenty one some people contended that the reason Mademoiselle Rye's always chose apartments up under the roof was to discourage the approach of beggars, peddlers, and callers. There were plenty of windows in her little front room. They were for the most part dingy, but as they were nearly always open it did not make so much difference. They often admitted into the room a good deal of smoke and soot, but at the same time all the light and air that there was came through them. From her windows could be seen the crescent of the river the masts of ships, and the big chimneys of the Mississippi steamers. A magnificent piano crowded the apartment. In the next room she slept, and in the third and last she harboured a little gasoline stove, on which she cooked her meals when disinclined to descend to the neighbouring restaurant. It was there also that she ate, keeping her belongings in a rare old buffet, dingy and battered from a hundred years of use. When Edna knocked at Mademoiselle Rise's front-room door, and entered. She discovered that person standing beside the window, engaged in mending or patching an old prunella gaiter. The little musician laughed all over when she saw Edna. Her laugh consisted of a contortion of the face and all the muscles of the body. She seemed strikingly homely, standing there in the afternoon light. She still wore the shabby lace and the artificial bunch of violets on the side of her head. "'So you remembered me at last,' said Mademoiselle. "'I had said to myself, Ah, bah! She will never come." "'Did you want me to come?' asked Edna, with a smile. "'I had not thought much about it,' answered Mademoiselle. The two had seated themselves on a little bumpy sofa which stood against the wall. "'I am glad, however, that you came. I have the water boiling back there, and was just about to make some coffee. You will drink a cup with me. And how is La Belle Dame? Always handsome, always healthy, always contented. She took Edna's hand in her strong, wiry fingers, holding it loosely without warmth, and executing a sort of double theme upon the back and palm. Yes, she went on, I sometimes thought, she will never come. She promised, as those women in society always do, without meaning it. She will not come. For I really don't believe you like me, Mrs. Pontellier. I don't know whether I like you or not, replied Edna, gazing down at the little woman with a quizzical look. The candour of Mrs. Pontellier's admission greatly pleased Mademoiselle Rise. She expressed her gratification by repairing forthwith to the region of the gasoline stove, and rewarding her guest with the promised cup of coffee. The coffee and the biscuit accompanying it proved very acceptable to Edna, who had declined refreshment at Madame Lebrun's, and was now beginning to feel hungry. Mademoiselle set the tray which she brought in upon a small table near at hand, and seated herself once again on the lumpy sofa. I have had a letter from your friend," she remarked, as she poured a little cream into Edna's cup and handed it to her. "'My friend? Yes, your friend Robert. He wrote to me from the city of Mexico.' "'Wrote to you?' repeated Edna in amazement, stirring her coffee absently. "'Yes, to me. Why not? Don't stir all the warmth out of your coffee. Drink it. Though the letter might as well have been sent to you, it was nothing but Mrs. Pontellier from beginning to end. Let me see it," requested the young woman entreatingly. No. A letter concerns no one but the person who writes it and the one to whom it is written. Haven't you just said it concerned me from beginning to end? It was written about you, not to you. Have you seen Mrs. Pontellier? How is she looking? he asks. As Mrs. Pontellier says, or as Mrs. Pontellier once said, if Mrs. Pontellier should call upon you, play for her that impromptu of Chopin's, my favourite. I heard it here a day or two ago, but not as you play it. I should like to know how it affects her. And so on, as if he supposed we were constantly in each other's society. Let me see the letter. Oh, no. Have you answered it? No. Let me see the letter. No, and again no. Then play the impromptu for me. It is growing late. What time do you have to be home? Time doesn't concern me. Your question seems a little rude. Play the impromptu. But you have told me nothing of yourself. What are you doing? Painting, laughed Edna. I am becoming an artist. Think of it. Aha! An artist? You have pretensions, madame. Why pretensions? Do you think I could not become an artist? I do not know you well enough to say. 
I do not know your talent or your temperament. To be an artist includes much. One must possess many gifts, absolute gifts, which have not been acquired by one's own effort. And moreover, to succeed, the artist must possess the courageous soul." "'What do you mean by the courageous soul?' "'Courageous, ma foi! The brave soul, the soul that dares and defies. Show me the letter, and play for me the impromptu. You see that I have persistence. Does that quality count for anything in art?" "'It counts with a foolish old woman whom you have captivated,' replied Mademoiselle, with her wriggling laugh. The letter was right there at hand in the drawer of the little table upon which Edna had just placed her coffee-cup. Mademoiselle opened the drawer and drew forth the letter, the topmost one. She placed it in Edna's hands, and without further comment arose and went to the piano. Mademoiselle played a soft interlude. It was an improvisation. She sat low at the instrument, and the lines of her body settle into ungraceful curves and angles that gave it an appearance of deformity. Gradually and imperceptibly the interlude melted into the soft opening minor chords of the Chopin impromptu. Edna did not know when the impromptu began or ended. She sat in the sofa corner, reading Robert's letter by the fading light. Mademoiselle had glided from the Chopin into the quivering love-notes of his old song, and back again to the impromptu, with its soulful and poignant longing. The shadows deepened in the little room. The music grew strange and fantastic, turbulent, insistent, plaintive, and soft with entreaty. The shadows grew deeper. The music filled the room. It floated out upon the night, over the housetops, the crescent of the river, losing itself in the silence of the upper air. Edna was sobbing, just as she had wept one midnight at Grand Deal when strange new voices awoke in her. She rose in some agitation to take her departure. "'May I come again, mademoiselle?' she asked at the threshold. "'Come whenever you feel like it. Be careful. The stairs and landings are dark. Don't stumble.' Mademoiselle re-entered and lit a candle. Robert's letter was on the floor. She stooped and picked it up. It was crumpled and damp with tears. Mademoiselle smoothed the letter out, restored it to the envelope, and replaced it in the table drawer. 22. One morning on his way into town Mr. Pontellier stopped at the house of his old friend and family physician, Dr. Mandelay. The doctor was a semi-retired physician, resting, as the saying is, upon his laurels. He bore a reputation for wisdom rather than skill, leaving the active practice of medicine to his assistants and younger contemporaries, and was much sought for in matters of consultation. A few families united to him by bonds of friendship he still attended when they required the services of a physician. The Pontelliers were among these. Mr. Pontellier found the doctor reading at the open window of his study. His house stood rather far back from the street, in the centre of a delightful garden, so that it was quiet and peaceful at the old gentleman's study window. He was a great reader. He stared up disapprovingly over his eyeglasses as Mr. Pontellier entered, wondering who had the temerity to disturb him at that hour of the morning. "'Ah! Pontellier! Not sick, I hope. Come and have a seat. What news do you bring this morning?' He was quite portly, with a profusion of grey hair and small blue eyes, which age had robbed of much of their brightness, but none of their penetration. "'No, oh, I'm never sick, doctor. You know that I come of tough fibre, of that old Creole race of Pontelliers that dry up and finally blow away. I came to consult—no, not precisely to consult—to talk to you about Edna. I don't know what ails her. "'Madame Pontellier not well.' marvelled the doctor. "'Why, I saw her—I think it was a week ago—walking along Canal Street, the picture of health, it seemed to me.' "'Yes, yes, she seems quite well,' said Mr. Pontellier, leaning forward and whirling his stick between his two hands. "'But she doesn't act well. She's odd. She's not like herself. I can't make her out, and I thought perhaps you'd help me.' "'How does she act?' inquired the doctor. "'Well, it isn't easy to explain.' said Mr. Pontellier, throwing himself back in his chair. "'She lets the housekeeping go to the Dickens.' "'Well, well, women are not all alike, my dear Pontellier. We've got to consider—' "'I know that. I told you I couldn't explain. Her whole attitude, toward me and everybody and everything, has changed. You know I have a quick temper, but I don't want to quarrel or be rude to a woman, especially my wife. 
Yes, I'm driven to it, and feel like ten thousand devils after I've made a fool of myself. She's making it devilishly uncomfortable for me," he went on nervously. She's got some sort of notion in her head concerning the eternal rights of women, and, you understand, we meet in the morning at the breakfast table. The old gentleman lifted his shaggy eyebrows, protruded his thick nether lip, and tapped the arms of his chair with his cushioned fingertips. What have you been doing to her, Pontellier? Doing? Parbleu! Has she? asked the doctor with a smile. Has she been associating of late with a circle of pseudo intellectual women, super spiritual superior beings? My wife has been telling me about them. That's the trouble, broke in Mr. Pontellier. She hasn't been associating with any one. She has abandoned her Tuesdays at home, has thrown over all her acquaintances, and goes tramping about by herself, moping in the street cars, getting in after dark. I tell you, she's peculiar. I don't like it. I feel a little worried over it. This was a new aspect for the doctor. Nothing hereditary? he asked seriously. Nothing peculiar about her family antecedents, is there? Oh, no, indeed. She comes of sound old Presbyterian Kentucky stock. The old gentleman, her father, I have heard, used to atone for his weekday sins with his Sunday devotions. I know for a fact that his race horses literally ran away with the prettiest bit of Kentucky farming land I ever laid eyes upon. Margaret, you know Margaret, she has all the Presbyterianism undiluted, and the youngest is something of a vixen. By the way, she gets married in a couple of weeks from now. Send your wife up to the wedding, exclaimed the doctor, foreseeing a happy solution. Let her stay among her own people for a while. It will do her good. That's what I want her to do. She won't go to the marriage. She says a wedding is one of the most lamentable spectacles on earth. Nice thing for a woman to say to her husband, exclaimed Mr. Pontellier, fuming anew at the recollection. Pontellier, said the doctor after a moment's reflection, let your wife alone for a while. Don't bother her, and don't let her bother you. Woman, my dear friend, is a very peculiar and delicate organism. A sensitive and highly organized woman, such as I know Mrs. Pontellier to be, is especially peculiar. It would require an inspired psychologist to deal successfully with them. And when ordinary fellows like you and me attempt to cope with their idiosyncrasies, the result is bungling. Most women are moody and whimsical. This is some passing whim of your wife, due to some cause or causes which you and I needn't try to fathom. But it will happily pass over, especially if you let her alone. Send her around to see me. Oh, I couldn't do that. There'd be no reason for it, objected Mr. Pontellier. Then I'll go around to see her, said the doctor. I'll drop into dinner some evening on Bon Ami. Do, by all means, urged Mr. Pontellier. What evening will you come? Say Thursday. Will you come Thursday? he asked, rising to take his leave. Very well, Thursday. My wife may possibly have some engagement for me Thursday. In case she has, I shall let you know. Otherwise, you may expect me. Mr. Pontellier turned before leaving to say, I am going to New York on business very soon. I have a big scheme on hand and want to be on the field proper to pull the ropes and handle the ribbons. We'll let you in on the inside if you say so, doctor, he laughed. No, I thank you, my dear sir, returned the doctor. I leave such ventures to you younger men with the fever of life still in your blood. What I wanted to say, continued Mr. Pontellier, with his hand on the knob, I may have to be absent a good while. Would you advise me to take Edna along? By all means, if she wishes to. If not, leave her here. Don't contradict her. The mood will pass, I assure you. It may take a month, two, three months, possibly longer, but it will pass. Have patience. Well, good-bye. A jeudi said Mr. Pontellier, as he let himself out. The doctor would have liked, during the course of conversation, to ask, Is there any man in the case? But he knew his Creole too well to make such a blunder as that. He did not resume his book immediately, but sat for a while meditatively looking out into the garden. 23. Edna's father was in the city, and had been with them several days. She was not very warmly or deeply attached to him, but they had certain tastes in common, and when together they were companionable. His coming was in the nature of a welcome disturbance. It seemed to furnish a new direction for her emotions. 
He had come to purchase a wedding gift for his daughter Janet, and an outfit for himself in which he might make a creditable appearance at her marriage. Mr. Pontellier had selected the bridal gift, as every one immediately concerned with him always deferred to his taste in such matters. And his suggestions on the question of dress, which too often assumes the nature of a problem, were of inestimable value to his father-in-law. But for the past few days the old gentleman had been upon Edna's hands, and in his society she was becoming acquainted with a new set of sensations. He had been a colonel in the Confederate army, and still maintained, with the title, the military bearing which had always accompanied it. His hair and moustache were white and silky, emphasizing the rugged bronze of his face. He was tall and thin, and wore his coats padded, which gave a fictitious breadth and depth to his shoulders and chest. Edna and her father looked very distinguished together, and excited a good deal of notice during their perambulations. Upon his arrival she began by introducing him to her atelier, and making a sketch of him. He took the whole matter very seriously. If her talent had been tenfold greater than it was, it would not have surprised him, convinced as he was that he had bequeathed to all of his daughters the germs of a masterful capability, which only depended upon their own efforts to be directed towards successful achievement. Before her pencil he sat rigid and unflinching, as he had faced the cannon's mouth in days gone by. He resented the intrusion of the children, who gaped with wondering eyes at him, sitting so stiff up there in their mother's bright atelier. When they drew near he motioned them away with an expressive action of the foot, loath to disturb the fixed lines of his countenance, his arms, or his rigid shoulders. Edna, anxious to entertain him, invited Mademoiselle Rise to meet him, having promised him a treat in her piano-playing, but Mademoiselle declined the invitation. So together they attended a soiree musicale at the Ratignolles. Monsieur and Madame Ratignolle made much of the Colonel, installing him as the guest of honor, and engaging him at once to dine with them the following Sunday, or any day which he might select. Madame coquetted him in the most captivating and naive manner, with eyes, gestures, and a profusion of compliments, till the Colonel's old head felt thirty years younger on his padded shoulders. Edna marvelled, not comprehending. She herself was almost devoid of coquetry. There were one or two men whom she observed at the soiree musicale, but she would never have felt moved to any kittenish display to attract their notice, to any feline or feminine wiles to express herself toward them. Their personality attracted her in an agreeable way. Her fancy selected them, and she was glad when a lull in the music gave him an opportunity to meet her and talk with her. Often on the street the glance of strange eyes had lingered in her memory, and sometimes had disturbed her. Mr. Pontellier did not attend the soiree musicale. He considered them bourgeois, and found more diversion at the club. To Madame Ratignolle he said the music dispensed at her soirees was too heavy, too far beyond his untrained comprehension. His excuse flattered her, but she disapproved of Mr. Pontellier's club, and she was frank enough to tell Edna so. "'It's a pity Mr. Pontellier doesn't stay home more in the evenings. I think he would be more—well, if you don't mind my saying it—more united if he did.' "'Oh, dear, no!' said Edna, with a blank look in her eyes. "'What should I do if he stayed home? We shouldn't have anything to say to each other.' She had not much of anything to say to her father, for that matter, but he did not antagonize her. She discovered that he interested her, though she realized that he might not interest her long, and for the first time in her life she felt as if she were thoroughly acquainted with him. He kept her busy serving him, administering to his wants. It amused her to do so. She would not permit a servant or one of the children to do anything for him which she might do herself. Her husband noticed, and thought it was the expression of a deep filial attachment, which he had never suspected. The colonel drank numerous toddies during the course of the day, which left him, however, imperturbed. He was an expert at concocting strong drinks. He had even invented some, to which he had given fantastic names, and for whose manufacture he required diverse ingredients that it devolved upon Edna to procure for him. When Dr. Mandelet dined with the Pontelliers on Thursday, he could discern in Mrs. Pontellier no trace of that morbid condition which her husband had reported to him. She was excited, and in a manner radiant. She and her father had been to the race-course, and their thoughts when they seated themselves at table were still occupied with the events of the afternoon, and their talk was still of the track. The doctor had not kept pace with turf affairs. He had certain recollections of racing in what he called the good old times, when the Lecomte stables flourished and he drew upon this fund of memory so that he might not be left out, and seem wholly devoid of the modern spirit. But he failed to impose upon the colonel, and was even far from impressing him with this trumped-up knowledge of bygone days. 
Edna had staked her father on this last venture, with the most gratifying results to both of them. Besides, they had met some very charming people, according to the Colonel's impressions. Mrs. Mortimer Merriman and Mrs. James Highcamp, who were there with Alcée Arabin, had joined them and had enlivened the hours in a fashion that warmed him to think of. Mr. Pontellier himself had no particular leaning towards horse-racing, and was even rather inclined to discourage it as a pastime, especially when he considered the fate of that bluegrass farm in Kentucky. He endeavoured in a general way to express a particular disapproval, and only succeeded in arousing the ire and opposition of his father-in-law. A pretty dispute followed, in which Edna warmly espoused her father's cause, and the doctor remained neutral. He observed his hostess attentively from under his shaggy brows, and noted a subtle change which had transformed her from the listless woman he had known, into a being who, for the moment, seemed palpitant with the forces of life. Her speech was warm and energetic. There was no repression in her glance or gesture. She reminded him of some beautiful, sleek animal waking up in the sun. The dinner was excellent. The claret was warm and the champagne was cold, and under their beneficent influence the threatened unpleasantness melted and vanished with the fumes of the wine. Mr. Pontellier warmed up and grew reminiscent. He told some amusing plantation experiences, recollections of old Iberville in his youth, when he hunted possum in company with some friendly darky, thrashed the pecan trees, shot the grobeck, and roamed the woods and fields in mischievous idleness. The colonel, with little sense of humor and of the fitness of things, related a sombre episode of those dark and bitter days in which he had acted a conspicuous part and always formed a central figure. Nor was the doctor happier in his selection when he told the old, ever new, and curious story of the waning of a woman's love, seeking strange new channels, only to return to its legitimate source after days of fierce unrest. It was one of the many little human documents which had been unfolded to him during his long career as a physician. The story did not seem especially to impress Edna. She had one of her own to tell, of a woman who paddled away with her lover one night in a pirogue, and never came back. They were lost amid the Baratarian islands, and no one ever heard of them or found trace of them from that day to this. It was a pure invention. She said that Madame Antoine had related it to her. That also was an invention. Perhaps it was from a dream she had had. But every glowing word seemed real to those who listened. They could feel the hot breath of the southern night. They could hear the long sweep of the pirogue through the glistening moonlit water, the beating of birds' wings, rising startled from among the reeds in the salt-water pools. They could see the faces of the lovers, pale, close together, wrapped in oblivious forgetfulness, drifting into the unknown. The champagne was cold, and its subtle fumes played fantastic tricks with Edna's memory that night. Outside, away from the glow of the fire and the soft lamplight, the night was chill and murky. The doctor doubled his old-fashioned cloak across his breast as he strode home through the darkness. He knew his fellow-creatures better than most men knew that inner life which so seldom unfolds itself to unanointed eyes. He was sorry he had accepted Pontellier's invitation. He was growing old, and beginning to need rest in an imperturbed spirit. He did not want the secrets of other lives thrust upon him. "'I hope it isn't Arabin,' he muttered to himself as he walked. "'I hope to heaven it isn't Alcée Arabin.'" 24. Edna and her father had a warm and almost violent dispute upon the subject of her refusal to attend her sister's wedding. Mr. Pontellier declined to interfere, to interpose either his influence or his authority. He was following Dr. Mandelay's advice, and letting her do as she liked. The colonel reproached his daughter for her lack of filial kindness and respect, her want of sisterly affection and womanly consideration. His arguments were labored and unconvincing. He doubted if Janet would accept any excuse forgetting that Edna had offered none. He doubted if Janet would ever speak to her again, and he was sure Margaret would not. Edna was glad to be rid of her father when he finally took himself off, with his wedding garments and his bridal gifts, with his padded shoulders, his Bible-reading, his toddies and ponderous oaths. Mr. Pontellier followed him closely. He meant to stop at the wedding on his way to New York, and endeavor by every means which money and love could devise, to atone somewhat for Edna's incomprehensible action. "'You are too lenient—too lenient by far, Léonce,' asserted the colonel. "'Authority, coercion are what is needed. Put your foot down good and hard. The only way to manage a wife. Take my word for it.' The colonel was perhaps unaware that he had coerced his own wife into her grave. Mr. Pontellier had a vague suspicion of it, which he thought it needless to mention at that late day. 
Edna was not so consciously gratified at her husband's leaving home as she had been over the departure of her father. As the day approached when he was to leave her for a comparatively long stay, she grew melting and affectionate, remembering his many acts of consideration and his repeated expressions of an ardent attachment. She was solicitous about his health and his welfare. She bustled around, looking after his clothing, thinking about heavy underwear, quite as Madame Ratignolle would have done under similar circumstances. She cried when he went away, calling him her dear good friend, and she was quite certain she would grow lonely before very long and go to join him in New York. But, after all, a radiant peace settled upon her when she at last found herself alone. Even the children were gone. Old Madame Pontellier had come herself and carried them off to Iberville with their quadroon. The old Madame did not venture to say she was afraid they would be neglected during Léonce's absence. She hardly ventured to think so. She was hungry for them, even a little fierce in her attachment. She did not want them to be wholly children of the pavement, she always said when begging to have them for a space. She wished them to know the country, with its streams, its fields, its freedom, so delicious to the young. She wished them to taste something of the life their father had lived and known, and loved when he too was a little child. When Edna was at last alone, she breathed a big, genuine sigh of relief. A feeling that was unfamiliar, but very delicious, came over her. She walked all through the house, from one room to another, as if inspecting it for the first time. She tried the various chairs and lounges, as if she had never sat and reclined upon them before. And she perambulated around the side of the house, investigating, looking to see if windows and shutters were secure and in order. The flowers were like new acquaintances. She approached them in a familiar spirit, and made herself at home among them. The garden walks were damp, and Edna called to the maid to bring out her rubber sandals. And there she stayed, and stooped, digging around the plants, trimming, picking dead dry leaves. The children's little dog came out, interfering, getting in her way. She scolded him, laughed at him, played with him. The garden smelled so good and looked so pretty in the afternoon sunlight. Edna plucked all the bright flowers she could find, and went into the house with them, she and the little dog. Even the kitchen assumed a sudden interesting character which she had never before perceived. She went in to give directions to the cook, to say that the butcher would have to bring less meat, that they would require only half their usual quantity of bread, of milk and groceries. She told the cook that she herself would be greatly occupied during Mr. Pontellier's absence, and begged her to take all thought and responsibility of the larder upon her own shoulders. That night Edna dined alone. The candelabra, with a few candles in the centre of the table, gave all the light she needed. Outside the circle of light in which she sat, the large dining-room looked solemn and shadowy. The cook, placed upon her metal, served a delicious repast, a luscious tenderloin broiled à point. The wine tasted good, the marron glacé seemed to be just what she wanted. It was so pleasant, too, to dine in a comfortable peignoir. She thought a little sentimentally about Léonce and the children, and wondered what they were doing. As she gave a dainty scrap or two to the doggie, she talked intimately to him about Etienne and Raoul. He was beside himself with astonishment and delight over these companionable advances, and showed his appreciation by his little quick snappy barks and a lively agitation. Then Edna sat in the library after dinner, and read Emerson until she grew sleepy. She realized that she had neglected her reading, and determined to start anew upon a course of improving studies, now that her time was completely her own to do with as she liked. After a refreshing bath, Edna went to bed. As she snuggled comfortably beneath the eiderdown, a sense of restfulness invaded her, such as she had not known before. 25. When the weather was dark and cloudy, Edna could not work. She needed the sun to mellow and temper her mood to the sticking point. She had reached a stage when she seemed to be no longer feeling her way, working, when in the humour, with sureness and ease and being devoid of ambition, and striving not toward accomplishment, she drew satisfaction from the work in itself. On rainy or melancholy days Edna went out and sought the society of the friends she had made at Grand Isle, or else she stayed indoors, and nursed a mood with which she was becoming too familiar for her own comfort and peace of mind. It was not despair, but it seemed to her as if her life were passing by, leaving its promise broken and unfulfilled. Yet there were other days when she listened, was led on and deceived by fresh promises which her youth held out to her. She went again to the races, and again. Alcée Araban and Mrs. Highcamp called for her one bright afternoon in Araban's drag. Mrs. Highcamp was a worldly but unaffected, intelligent, slim, tall blonde woman in the forties, 
with an indifferent manner and blue eyes that stared. She had a daughter who served her as a pretext for cultivating the society of young men of fashion. Elsé Arabin was one of them. He was a familiar figure at the race-course, the opera, the fashionable clubs. There was a perpetual smile in his eyes, which seldom failed to awaken a corresponding cheerfulness in any one who looked into them and listened to his good-humoured voice. His manner was quiet, and at times a little insolent. He possessed a good figure, a pleasing face, not overburdened with depth of thought or feeling, and his dress was that of the conventional man of fashion. He admired Edna extravagantly after meeting her at the races with her father. He had met her before on other occasions, but she had seemed to him unapproachable until that day. It was at his instigation that Mrs. Highcamp called to ask her to go with them to the jockey club to witness the turf event of the season. There were possibly a few track men out there who knew the racehorse as well as Edna, but there certainly was none who knew it better. She sat between her two companions as one having authority to speak. She laughed at Arabin's pretensions, and deplored Mrs. Highcamp's ignorance. The racehorse was a friend and intimate associate of her childhood. The atmosphere of the stables and the breath of the bluegrass paddock revived in her memory and lingered in her nostrils. She did not perceive that she was talking like her father, as the sleek geldings ambled in review before them. She played for very high stakes, and fortune favoured her. The fever of the game flamed in her cheeks and eyes, and it got into her blood and into her brain like an intoxicant. People turned their heads to look at her, and more than one lent an attentive ear to her utterances, hoping thereby to secure the elusive but ever-desired tip. Arabin caught the contagion of excitement which drew him to Edna like a magnet. Mrs. Highcamp remained, as usual, unmoved, with her indifferent stare and uplifted eyebrows. Edna stayed and dined with Mrs. Highcamp upon being urged to do so. Arabin also remained, and sent away his drag. The dinner was quiet and uninteresting save for the cheerful efforts of Arabin to enliven things. Mrs. Highcamp deplored the absence of her daughter from the races, and tried to convey to her what she had missed by going to the Dante reading, instead of joining them. The girl held a geranium leaf up to her nose and said nothing, but looked knowing and non-committal. Mr. Highcamp was a plain, bald-headed man, who only talked under compulsion. He was unresponsive. Mrs. Highcamp was full of delicate courtesy and consideration toward her husband. She addressed most of her conversation to him at table. They sat in the library after dinner, and read the evening papers together under the drop-light, while the younger people went into the drawing-room nearby and talked. Miss Highcamp played some selections from Grieg upon the piano. She seemed to have apprehended all of the composer's coldness, and none of his poetry. While Edna listened she could not help wondering if she had lost her taste for music. When the time came for her to go home, Mr. Highcamp grunted a lame offer to escort her, looking down at his slippered feet with tactless concern. It was Arabin who took her home. The car ride was long, and it was late when they reached Esplanade Street. Arabin asked permission to enter for a second to light his cigarette. His match-safe was empty. He filled his match-safe, but did not light his cigarette until he left her, after she had expressed her willingness to go to the races with him again. Edna was neither tired nor sleepy. She was hungry again, for the high camp dinner, though of excellent quality, had lacked abundance. She rummaged in the larder and brought forth a slice of Gruyere and some crackers. She opened a bottle of beer which she found in the ice-box. Edna felt extremely restless and excited. She vacantly hummed a fantastic tune as she poked at the wood embers on the hearth and munched a cracker. She wanted something to happen—something, anything. She did not know what. She regretted that she had not made Arabin stay a half-hour to talk over the horses with her. She counted the money she had won. But there was nothing else to do. So she went to bed, and tossed there for hours in a sort of monotonous agitation. In the middle of the night she remembered that she had forgotten to write a regular letter to her husband, and she decided to do so next day, and tell him about her afternoon at the jockey club. She lay wide awake, composing a letter which was nothing like the one which she wrote next day. When the maid awoke her in the morning Edna was dreaming of Mr. Highcamp playing the piano at the entrance of a music store on Canal Street, while his wife was saying to Alsay Arabin, as they boarded an Esplanade Street car, what a pity that so much talent has been neglected! But I must go." When, a few days later, Alsé Arabin called again for Edna in his drag, Mrs. Highcamp was not with him. He said they would pick her up, but as that lady had not been apprised of his intention of picking her up, she was not at home. The daughter was just leaving the house to attend the meeting of a branch folklore society, and regretted that she could not accompany them. Arabin appeared nonplussed, and asked Edna if there were any one else she cared to ask. She did not deem it worth while to go in search of any of the fashionable acquaintances from whom she had withdrawn herself. She thought of Madame Ratignolle, 
but knew that her fair friend did not leave the house except to take a languid walk around the block with her husband after nightfall. Mademoiselle Rise would have laughed at such a request from Edna. Madame Lebrun might have enjoyed the outing, but for some reason Edna did not want her. So they went alone, she and Arobin. The afternoon was intensely interesting to her. The excitement came back upon her like a remittent fever. Her talk grew familiar and confidential. It was no labor to become intimate with Arbin. His manner invited easy confidence. The preliminary stage of becoming acquainted was one which he always endeavored to ignore when a pretty and engaging woman was concerned. He stayed and dined with Edna. He stayed and sat beside the wood fire. They laughed and talked, and before it was time to go he was telling her how different life might have been if he had known her years before. With an ingenuous frankness he spoke of what a wicked, ill-disciplined boy he had been, and impulsively drew up his cuff to exhibit upon his wrist the scar from a sabre-cut which he had received in a duel outside of Paris when he was nineteen. She touched his hand as she scanned the red cicatrice on the inside of his white wrist. A quick impulse that was somewhat spasmodic impelled her fingers to close in a sort of clutch upon his hand. He felt the pressure of her pointed nails in the flesh of his palm. She arose hastily and walked toward the mantel. "'The sight of a wound or scar always agitates and sickens me,' she said. "'I shouldn't have looked at it.' "'I beg your pardon,' he entreated, following her. "'It never occurred to me that it might be repulsive.' He stood close to her, and the effrontery in his eyes repelled the old, vanishing self in her, yet drew all her awakening sensuousness. He saw enough in her face to impel him to take her hand and hold it while he said his lingering good-night. "'Will you go to the races again?' he asked. No, she said. I've had enough of the races. I don't want to lose all the money I've won, and I've got to work when the weather is bright instead of— Yes, work, to be sure. You promise to show me your work. What morning may I come up to your atelier? Tomorrow? No. Day after? No, no. Oh, please, don't refuse me. I know something of such things. I might help you with a stray suggestion or two. No. Good night. Why don't you go after you have said good-night? I don't like you," she went on in a high, excited pitch, attempting to draw away her hand. She felt that her words lacked dignity and sincerity, and she knew that he felt it. "'I'm sorry you don't like me. I'm sorry I offended you. How have I offended you? What have I done? Can't you forgive me?' And he bent and pressed his lips upon her hand, as if he wished never more to withdraw them. "'Mr. Arabin," she complained. I'm greatly upset by the excitement of the afternoon. I'm not myself. My manner must have misled you in some way. I wish you to go, please." She spoke in a monotonous, dull tone. He took his hat from the table and stood with eyes turned from her, looking into the dying fire. For a moment or two he kept an impressive silence. "'Your manner has not misled me, Mrs. Pontellier,' he said finally. "'My own emotions have done that. I couldn't help it. When I'm near you, how could I help it? Don't think anything of it. Don't bother, please. You see, I go when you command me. If you wish me to stay away, I shall do so. If you let me come back, I—oh, you will let me come back." He cast one appealing glance at her, to which she made no response. Else Arabin's manner was so genuine that it often deceived even himself. Edna did not care or think whether it were genuine or not. When she was alone she looked mechanically at the back of her hand which he had kissed so warmly. Then she leaned her head down on the mantelpiece. She felt somewhat like a woman who in a moment of passion is betrayed into an act of infidelity, and realizes the significance of the act without being wholly awakened from its glamour. The thought was passing vaguely through her mind. What would he think? She did not mean her husband. She was thinking of Robert Lebrun. Her husband seemed to her now like a person whom she had married without love as an excuse. She lit a candle and went up to her room. Alcée Arabin was absolutely nothing to her. Yet his presence, his manners, the warmth of his glances, and above all the touch of his lips upon her hand had acted like a narcotic upon her. She slept a languorous sleep, interwoven with vanishing dreams. End of Part 5